So the talk today, this is an outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about uh, Tolvaptan, uh, briefly describe how Tolvaptan works. I'm going to talk about uh, what the research evidence is for its use, and then discuss how patients are selected for treatment. And then at the end, I'm going to try to give you a feel for what uh, starting and taking Tolvaptan involves and briefly talk about our uh, results from the unit here at Salford. Uh, next slide, please. Well, Graham, so, can I just jump in? Have you got your, your uh, video on? Oh, sorry. Because we, 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 we can't see you at the moment. Well, I, I certainly can't. According to this, it says host has disabled it. Oh dear, I think we, we, need, to, we, need, to, um, we need to sort that out and then just bear with us. Is that on? There you go. We can see you. Thank you. You can see me. Okay, that's great. So why is all that time important? Um, it is important. Um, PKD is the most common uh, inherited kidney condition that we see. It accounts for about one in 20 people needing a kidney transplant or dialysis. And 13 million people worldwide are affected by PKD. So any treatment to help is going to have significant uh, benefits. Next slide, please. So Tovactan is a drug. Uh, it was first given its European um, Medicines Agency approval in 2015. It's aimed at treating people with PKD whose disease is progressing quickly. Uh, it is used to slow down the development and growth of the cysts in the kidney and aiming to decrease the rate of decline of kidney function. And most importantly, until uh, this drug became available, we didn't have any drug treatment that was proven to slow down the progression of PKD. And before 12 hours, and the only thing that we had to offer patients with PKD was tight blood pressure control. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> Albert, in fact, has already uh, quite eloquently described the, uh, the way that Tolvaptan uh, works. But just to go over, on the top left here is the, uh, the nephron, the single functioning unit in the kidney. Uh, each kidney will have uh, one and a half million of these uh, nephrons. The, the, on the top left is the, the healthy nephron. On the bottom right is the nephron with the development of cysts. And in PKD, uh, the defect is in the cilia, these processes uh, that line uh, the cells of the, of the tubules in the, uh, in the, in the kidney. And the, the cilia in health are, uh, move around and are, are very active metabolically. And we feel that the, uh, in PKD, the cellular di dysregulation that happens is the trigger for the de development of cysts uh, in the kidney. Although tolvaptan itself isn't the only mechanism um, for development of the, of the cysts, as you can see by the, the rather uh, busy slide. And I believe there's a session later on on research about uh, cilia, and uh, I'm sure we're going into that with more detail. Next slide, please. So uh, Albert discussed this. Um, tolvaptan works by blocking the basis, vasopressin receptor on the cells and improving the cellular metabolism and restoring some function to the, uh, to the cilia. Uh, the downside is that this receptor is a water receptor in the kidney and when it's blocked, uh, there's an excessive amount of urine produced. Next slide, please. So Tolvactan, uh, the first uh, publication about um, how effective this uh, treatment was, came out in 2012, uh, some time ago, and uh, it was five years after the publication of, of this uh, in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine that the, uh, the drug got its first licenses. Next slide, please. The, 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 most, uh, the, the seminal publication was the TEMPO trial. Uh, this was sponsored by a drug company called Otsuka, and all of the trials that they uh, are involved with, they name with classical music themes. So the, the TEMPO trial was the Tolvactan efficacy and safety in management of polycystic kidney disease 
and its outcomes. Next slide, please. This was a large trial. It was a, 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 an international trial. On the top left and blue are all the, the countries that contribute patients to the research. On the bottom left is the characteristics of the patients that were involved. Uh, it was what's called a double-blinded placebo trial where the, uh, the researchers didn't know whether patients were on treatment or on a placebo treatment. And for every, uh, every, the, 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 every patient rand was randomised to either receive placebo or active treatment. And twice as many people were put onto treatment as were in the placebo group. And while this trial was an, a very well-designed, large, scientifically valid trial, there are uh, some limitations for, to the trial. For example, nobody over 50 was actually put into the trial. Um, also, they recruited patients who had uh, various levels of kidney function, in particular, they recruited a large number of people whose kidney function was actually normal, uh, which may have um, led to some interesting um, ways that uh, the results could be interpreted, and I'll come back to that later. So people in the trial were, uh, were monitored for three years. Uh, they had scans of their kidneys, MRI scans of their kidneys on a yearly basis. And in the trial, uh, various outcomes were measured. Uh, they chose to take their primary endpoint, the most important endpoint, as the change in size of the kidneys uh, over the period of time. And they also looked at other factors, uh, like, for example, the change, the decline of the kidney function uh, whilst on treatment. And they also measured uh, pain, and I'll, I'll come back to uh, pain. Again, Albert did mention uh, pain. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the way that uh, patients in the trial were put onto the Tolvac Uh Patients were selected and randomised, and if you were randomised to go on to treatment, uh, you would take the drug initially at a, at a low dose, and one week later, uh, go up onto a middle dose, and if the patient could tolerate uh, the side effects from the Tolvac and they'd then go up to a top dose. And al although in the trial, this dose titration was taken on a weekly basis, most people in clinical practice find it easy to do this on a, on a monthly basis, and this is uh, what we have done. So um, again, large numbers of patients treated for three years and the outcomes measured uh, at the end. Next slide, please. So this slide is the results of the what we call the primary endpoint of the, of the trial. And uh, the, what they were measuring here was the uh, increase in the size of the kidneys over the period of time at baseline 12 months, two years and three years. So first of all, you can see there's quite a spread of uh, variation of the results here. Uh, but on the, the red line the, is the placebo line. And that was the rate of increase of uh, the kidneys in, in the trial. And the blue line is the patient receiving the tolvactam. And first of all, the lines are distinctly separate and statistically significant change. And in fact, people on treatment, the rate of increase in the size of the kidneys was halved. So this was a very significant outcome. And also they tried to analyze in the trial, which patients might benefit most in terms of age, whether the patient was uh, hypertensive or whether kidney function uh, would be uh, would would respond better. But in fact, uh, there wasn't a great deal of change there. Um, with patients, uh, there weren't people who who seemed to respond more than more than others. And that's uh, what's shown on the the plot on the right hand side. Next slide, please. So how was the kidney function affected? Uh, this is a similar uh, plot over the three year period and kidney function was measured. And the, uh, on the red line again is patients on the placebo. And uh, again, the lines, the, the blue line is patients on treatment. And again, the lines are separate and this is statistically significant. So pe people on treatment, their kidney function uh, declined by 2.6 mills or I, I think in percentage terms 2.6 percent compared to people who weren't on treatment 3.8 mills or 3.8 percent so again that was uh, a significant result um, and again uh, there weren't any particular indicators as to who would be 
who would get the most benefit from being on treatment. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, pain um, measurements in the in the Tempo trial, and the thing to say about this is that people in the trial uh, seem to experience less pain, although it probably didn't reach its statistical significance. Um, but in the in the trial itself, the pain events were the only pain events that were monitored were severe pain. Uh, for example, pain when there was an infection or a kidney stone or a cyst rupture or, or bleed. Um, what they didn't measure in the trial was the kind of the low grade pain that so many patients seem to experience, which uh, Albert touched on in the talk. That wasn't measured. It was only acute pain events. So what we've seen in clinical practice is that many patients do actually get a very significant improvement in pain uh, control. Um, we, and we've had um, some very, a, a couple of patients, in fact, who uh, were on requiring very strong painkillers to get the pain under control with morphine uh, based pain control who've been able to come off all uh, painkillers completely and talking to other people around the country other people have had similar uh, experience so pain although it wasn't statistically significant in the, in the trial in clinical practice we do see uh, very helpful reductions in pain control next slide So just to summarise the, the results of the trial, uh, over a three-year period, the tolvactan slowed the rate of increase of the kidney size. It slowed the decline of kidney function, and people did experience less pain on treatment. Next slide, please. Next. So the limitations of the trial was that it was only over a three-year period. And it was then difficult to kind of extrapolate to how that might uh, be effective over a kind of a lifetime. Uh, if you're on treatment and it's beneficial, you could be on it for the rest of your life. And we, there are, we don't at the moment have, the, whilst there are many people who've been on treatment for up to 10 years, uh, there's limited amounts of scientific evidence and publications of people who have been on treatment long term. And various models have been proposed to kind of extrapolate to how much benefit people might derive from being on treatment. Uh, this is the model derived by the company Otsuka, who manufactured Tolax. And according to their model, you might gain uh, five years without needing a kidney transplant uh, or dialysis. Uh, whether that is uh, true or not is difficult to say. Uh, but the super actually um, sponsoring another trial called the PAS trial, uh, recruiting people who start Tolvaptan as a long-term study to give us more information about the long-term uh, benefits of Tolvaptan and also uh, to give us more reassurance in terms of the long-term safety data. Next slide, please. So I've talked about the, the benefits of Tolvactan. Here uh, is the, uh, the downside of the side effects. And the majority of the side effects are related to that block of the basal pressing receptor blocking and the excessive production of urine. So patients produce more urine in the day. Patients can get thirsty. Um, patients will be passing urine at, at night. And we aim to uh, give education to patients starting on treatment and encourage fluid intake. We actually aim to get people to take about six to seven litres of fluid over a 24 hour period. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Graham, can I just jump in here? We, we, we are getting a number of questions coming through and I think you're, go you're going to be answering those at the end, aren't you? Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I'm ahead of time, so there should be plenty of time. Yeah, super. okay. So you know, just just to those people that are answering questions, we are we are we are aware of those, and um, we'll, we'll come to you. Okay, that's great. So I mentioned some of the limitations of the Tempo trial, um, for particularly um, um, people over fifty weren't in that trial. Um, people with 
uh, lower levels of kidney function weren't included in the trial. Uh, you had to have a, a, an EGFR of above 30 to qualify to go into the trial. And also in the trial, there were some concerns about uh, liver function of people in the, in, the, in the TEMPO trial. There were a few patients who developed arrangements of liver function who theoretically, if they carried on on treatment, may have developed significant liver disease. A follow-up trial to the TEMPO trial was the REPRISE trial. I'm not going to go into this trial in detail, but just show the results. Uh, of, of next slide, please. So the summary of, the, of, of this, uh, the second trial was that it proved its effectiveness in older patient groups. Uh, it also proved effectiveness in more advanced uh, kidney disease. Uh, people with CKD stage four uh, were shown to benefit. And it also gave us um, reassurance about the concerns about the liver uh, toxicity. Next slide, please. So this is the slide showing the, uh, the patients who developed changes in their liver uh, functions. And if you were basically, if you were in on the square, if you were in the top right square, uh, you would be in danger of developing uh, significant liver disease. And as you can see, no patients actually got into that group. So this was uh, very reassuring. Although in practice, in, uh, the, we, the way that when we use the drug because of the safety concerns, uh, there are rigorous safety checks with monthly uh, testing of liver function tests just to reassure us that there is no uh, ongoing signal of liver toxicity. Next slide, please. So this is the, the way that uh, clinicians are advised to select patients for treatment. And this is uh, a little uh, messy. Um, guidelines have come from uh, various sources and different uh, governing bodies. Um, first of all, in the, uh, in the UK, uh, NICE have given guidance to say that we should offer treatment to people with CKD stages two and three with rapidly declining kidney function. Uh, but they didn't actually uh, specify what rapidly declining kidney function was. The Scottish uh, Medical Committee have given advice that they have suggested that people with CKD stages one, two and three uh, can be offered treatments and they basically didn't give any guidelines in terms of uh, kidney function. And the, at the bottom is the European guidance, uh, which again is uh, complicated. And just to note that because in the TEMPO trial, nobody over 50 uh, was recruited in the trial, they don't, don't advise uh, offering treatment to patients over 50, which uh, is somewhat strange given that many patients will be um, have declining kidney function over the, once they've got over the age of 50. In the middle is the guidance that we use in uh, England, and this is the Renal Association Working Group uh, that went with the NICE guidelines, say, just in treatment for stages two and three, and actually defined uh, rapidly declining kidney function in terms of uh, the size of the kidneys on scans or risk calculation or on the evidence of uh, declining kidney function. So if you have records of kidney function over years, if the kidney function has declined by uh, 5%, over, more than 5% over five years, or more than 12.5%, sorry, 5% over one year, or 12.5% over five years, you would be eligible uh, for treatment. Next slide, please. So this is a kind of a patient pathway uh, for uh, using uh, tolvaxan. So a patient will be uh, selected. This is the way that we uh, go about the uh, offering treatment in, in Salford. Uh, we have a dedicated PKD clinic. Uh, patients will be in the clinic with various levels of kidney function. At each uh, visit, patient will be assessed to see if they're eligible. Uh, if they're eligible for treatment, uh, we'll let you know. 
we would then invite you uh, to uh, an education session with one of the uh, arena uh, pharmacist specialists to talk about the treatment that involves uh, and review uh, any concerns about uh, other medication. Uh, once uh, the decision has been made to go on to treatment, to be supplied with the, a month's treatment uh, from the pharmacy, the uh, patient would then come back in four weeks uh, and then we would if everything is well, we would increase the dose to the middle dose uh, and then review in another month and then go up to the top dose. I'm assuming patients on top dose, the, the, uh, the, there would then be monthly visits for 18 months. Um, in, the, in the long term, uh, we hope to get more uh, evidence in terms of patients that we put on to Tolvax and will be invited into long term study if they wish to. Uh, take part in that uh, and we put nearly 90 patients onto treatment in the, in the units at Sopwick House so we have a uh, significant experience but there are other units that put more people onto treatment. Next slide please. So I mentioned the uh, the, the pharmacist uh, being involved, the session will uh, probably take 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, they'll explain what the treatment involves to the patient. Uh, they'll go through reasons, check, just check that the patient is eligible uh, to identify any special uh, requirements in, with the patient. They'll explain to the patient how to take the drug. It is a twice daily uh, medication. Uh, the first dose is taken in the morning and it's a larger dose. Uh, you would expect uh, to then, within a couple of hours, uh, pass quite a lot of urine. Patients say that the, the, the maximum diuretic effect is at two hours. Some patients could be passing urine four times in an hour at that stage. The effect then dies off, and then eight hours afterwards, the second dose, smaller dose, would be taken, and a similar increase in the urine output would be expected. Uh, to get around the excessive uh, urine output, you need to uh, increase your fluid intake. Uh, we'll, we'd also explain uh, that if you miss a dose, uh, don't uh, double up, uh, just go back onto the next uh, dose that's planned. Uh, we would always advise you should not be on treatment with Tolvactan if you wish uh, to get pregnant. Uh, we advise that if you're on Tolvactan, uh, you should take uh, precautions against getting pregnant and obviously the treatment uh, should not be used if you are pregnant. Um, next slide please. Thanks. Next slide. Uh, okay and we uh, we'd supplement the uh, the verbal advice given uh, with uh, some written information and uh, this information also goes out to primary care when we initiate people on treatment. Next slide, Tess, please. These are some of the things that would give us some cause of concern about going on to treatment, not necessarily completely rule out uh, going on to treatment, uh, but any patients with signs of early uh, liver disease or damage, that might be a concern to us. Uh, people who have limited access to water or, or would be prone to uh, dehydration um, that would be a concern. Uh, people who have already have difficulty passing urine, uh, for example, older men who have prostatic disease, um, going on to treatment would in increase the rupture of urine, that would be exacerbated. Some patients may have other medical conditions where the salts in the bloodstream are disturbed, uh, particularly sodium levels. Histories of allergy and glucose, um, lactose intolerance may give concern that the, uh, the drug could be absorbed um, in a, a changed pattern. People with diabetes, we have put people with diabetes onto treatment without problem, but again, uh, some people with diabetes can be prone to uh, passing uh, large amounts of urine. Uh, a raised uric acid, this is the, uh, the part of the bloodstream that can predispose to episodes of gout. 
um, the, the tolvactam uh, can increase the uric acid level and we have seen patients uh, develop gout and have had people who already do get gout have had uh, flare-ups of gout whilst on treatment but it's almost always uh, settled down and there are uh, measures that we can take to counteract that and there are some medicines that can interact with tolvactam that might cause us concerns. Next slide please. Tess. These are other things that would completely uh, rule out as considering you for treatment. Uh, patients who are known to have already uh, liver disease and liver damage that would uh, rule out because of the concerns about liver toxicity. Any known previous allergy to the ingredients in tolvactam. Patients who are dehydrated. Uh, if you already had derangements of the salts in the bloodstream, particularly a high sodium, we wouldn't consider you. Uh, patients who can't tell, some people can't tell um, if they are uh, thirsty, that they particularly may have had a, a stroke or can't access fluid easily. I mentioned before about pregnancy and breastfeeding. And also, if you're unable to uh, come to and have monitoring on a monthly basis, um, it is a mandatory requirement uh, to have the blood testing for the, uh, just to measure the kidney function, but also the liver test. If you're not able to do that, uh, we wouldn't embark on initiating treatment. Next slide, please. And again, these are the common uh, side effects. Uh, for thirst, over 50%, uh, people will be thirsty on treatment. Uh, passing more urine, polyuria, uh, nearly 40%. Passing urine at night, uh, around 30%. Um, and although we've seen uh, derangements in liver function uh, tests, it's usually just a temporary thing, and almost always not related to the, uh, to the tolvactam. And it's interesting that patients, uh, our experience is that patients can go on to treatment and probably in the first few months on treatment, uh, that's the most likely time that somebody will just turn around to us and say, I can't take these side effects anymore, I'll discontinue treatment. Although patients who actually persist, the, the tolerance of the side effects actually improves. Now, whether this is just somebody getting into a pattern psychologically of dealing uh, with the side effects, or often we, uh, we feel that the bladder capacity uh, may actually increase, so you're able to hold more urine in the bladder and actually pass urine, you may be passing an increased volume of urine, but you may not be going to the toilets as often. So the, the, the passing of urine at night, um, disturbance of sleep does die down. And a, a lot of patients are clearly very happy, well adjusted on, on, on treatment. And I'll come to some of the results that we've uh, had at, at Salford with these patients. Next slide, please. please. So I mentioned, Gwen, can I just give you a quick, um, a quick yeah. time check? Um, we've okay. actually got about five minutes or so, and um, okay. the questions are, are starting to stack up. Okay. okay. Uh, I'll skip a few slides. Next, next slide, Tess, please. So I've mentioned the eight um, monthly visits. Next slide, Tess. Holidays. We don't mind if people go on holiday and miss drugs, particularly if they're going to hot, hot uh, climbs. Next slide, Tess. Tess, I wonder if it's possible just to go to the, sli the slide on the, 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 with the outcomes, with the pie chart. Great. So I do want to highlight this, uh, the, our um, patient outcomes for the group at Salford. Uh, this pie chart shows people who've been uh, managed to stay on treatment for six months. And we have put people onto treatment who weren't actually fit fit the criteria from the trials. So these patients have been on treatment for more than six months, and this is what's happened to their kidney function, which is really different to the outcomes in the trials. Um, so around about 10% of people, there's been no impact on their kidney function. 37% have had slow progression. 30% of the kidney function is just completely stabilized and 23% uh, have had improved kidney function. So this is just to stress that in clinical practice, you may well experience results that don't fit 
uh, with the trial evidence. And I think the main driver for this is the fact that in the trials, people were put into the trials who had normal kidney function, and that may have skewed the, uh, the results of people who uh, actually had rapidly declining kidney function. Um, so I'll finish there and go to the questions if I can. So, Jane, do I? Okay, so I can. Yeah, hi, hi Ben. So, so yeah, you've, we, so we, if, you, if we, we've got a number of questions in Q and A, and I wonder if I mean, if you, if you want to click on that and, ha and have a look at those, or actually, what we can do is we can read some out. I wonder if I, if I actually can start with a question that has popped up throughout the thread. There, it's a bit, little bit controversial. Um, so, 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 so a number of people have, have, have mentioned that they've been advised by consultants that drinking lots and lots of water is going to have the same effect as taking Tolvaptal and have been advised sure. not to take it. Yes, well, opinions do vary uh, on uh, how uh, effective Tolvaptal is. Uh, the first thing he says, as, as Albert mentioned in his presentation, taking increased uh, fluid increasing your fluid intake will suppress vasopressin receptor and has uh, theoretically uh, benefits in uh, preserving kidney function. Uh, but the patients in the uh, 12 Acton and the reprise trials were already advised to increase their fluid intake uh, before going in onto 12 Acton. So the, the, the benefits of being on, on treatment were also as a result of increased fluid intake and being on the treatment. So uh, the, the Tolvaptan, I'm sure, has, does have uh, a beneficial effect. Um, some people are, uh, don't believe the results of the trials and because the, the side effect profile, I think that some nephrologists are quite hesitant to put people onto treatment. Um, but uh, having used uh, the treatment myself, I'm quite convinced that there is a beneficial effect for a large number of people. Okay, thank you. Uh, somebody else here is asking uh, whether tilvaptan can affect fertility in, uh, in men. I'm not aware of any evidence for that. Uh, I'm not sure if any of the other uh, panel members have come across that, but I'm not, I'm not aware of any changes. Can, can, you, can you see the Q&A, um, Graham? I can only see three questions. If you could read out the, the out. Yeah. Somebody here is asking, they've been on, they're saying that they've been on Tol, uh, uh, sorry, they've, they've, they've been on Tolvaptan for nearly three years. Um, yes. Obviously you have to drink lots more water as, 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 as part of, of doing that. First can be quite bad at times, but controllable. So apologies, I don't think there's, there's, there's actually not a question there. I think they're really just talking about, about the first that comes with it, which I guess is um, yes. part and parcel, really. That's the common side effect that we see, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, th this person here is asking, um, would, you, um, would you consider a stage one patient who suffers regular severe pain as a suitable candidate for Tilvaptan? So that um, we, in, in England, we are governed by the, the NICE guidance and we are not allowed to put people uh, onto treatment with uh, CKD stage one, i.e. normal uh, kidney function. Uh, that's disappointing because uh, there are many people with stage one uh, disease who actually have very uh, large kidneys and experience pain. Um, uh, that's different if you're in Scotland, the Scottish guidance is different and patients can go on to treatment. So there's, I'm afraid there's a bit of a postcode lottery there. Uh, the only thing to say is that in the fullness of time, uh, it is likely that the person with uh, stage one kidney disease will uh, drift down to stage two and three and may become eligible. Okay. Um, so, so another one here, another one here is saying, are scans the only way to assess if Tolvaptan has been successful in uh, reducing kidney volume? Uh, different units do uh, different things. Uh, if you wish to measure uh, the size of the kidneys 
some units do do MRI scans on a, a yearly or, or two yearly basis. Uh, it is the measuring the, uh, the tub kidney volume is the only way to keep track of that. The difficulty is that whilst you're on treatment, you're not, not really sure uh, what a change in size actually means. I.e., uh, if you're on treatment and the kidneys increase in size by a certain amount, you don't know uh, what the change would have been if you've not been uh, on treatment. Um, personally, I, I don't think there's much to be gained unless you'd be using scans in a, in a, in a research environment. Thank you. Another one here, uh, another one about salt. Um, if pot and toll vap time, would salt intake need to be reduced? Uh, we don't give a specific salt target. We just advise about uh, uh, not taking excessive amounts, amounts of salt. Uh, I don't think that there's a great deal of evidence about um, salt restriction in, in this patient group. Thank you here. We've, 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 we, this, this is just somebody really that's just observing that, 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 that passing on their experience that, that, that this person said that they've been on health apps for a long time. Um, now starting to be um, being a, a trial patient, the, the, the thirst and excessive urine has settled down. Yes. Uh, I think what they're saying is it's, you know, at first it was, it was, it, it was hard to manage, but it has kind of settled. Is that, is that, is that, is that quite, um, that quite typical? Yes, that's a, that's a, that's a typical pattern. Um, most patients who can kind of stick with it for uh, six to 12 months, they seem to get into a rhythm with the, with the medication. Uh, the, the, the side effects are still there, but things just seem to be uh, more manageable. And as, as I mentioned, we do think that patients may actually get kind of an increase in the bladder capacity that makes things a lot uh, easier in the long term. And the other thing is that um, pain control, which I mentioned earlier on, uh, we've had, um, not everybody gets pain, obviously. I think it's around 30-40% of patients will, it, will get pain. And there's a, I think there's a certain low-grade background uh, discomfort that just seems to improve on treatment. Although people who, um, I think the, the increase, uh, the, the pain, reduction in pain symptoms, it's almost uh, within a few days of going on treatment that it improves patients a lot uh, reported that to us. Okay, thank you. Just one final question then, because I, um, we're, we're, we've come to the end of your session and I know that you've got, you've got commitments this afternoon. Um, so this person is asking, is it acceptable to take Tolvaptan but miss two days a month due to regular travel commitments internationally? Yes, there's no, uh, we don't have any concerns about that. Uh, we, if people wish to, for example, fly to Spain, um, it's impractical to take all that time and then be uh, stuck in an aircraft. You'd have limited access to fluids and going to the toilet isn't going to be uh, two or three times in a flight isn't going to be fun. So we don't mind people miss having a drug holiday for a day or a couple of days uh, or on long car journeys. Uh, we are quite happy for patients to uh, take a go uh, abroad for a week or two and have uh, a holiday from the drug. Um, we, we have many patients who actually do that and they just, just simply go back on treatment when they come back. Thank you. So, I'm sorry, I've just got one more thing that's just popped up. It's a question that's from Tess. Um, but I actually can't, I'm not sure I can see the question. That's a question about children. Tess, would you like to sort of jump in and... Yeah, um, we've, had two, we've had two questions about Tovapton and children. So we know it's not licensed for uh, children uh, below the age of 18 at the moment, but there is a trial in children which is being conducted at the moment. A yes, global trial. I, I only see uh, adult patients, so mm. my knowledge in children is, uh, is limited. But I, I can comment that obviously uh, uh, with the familial uh, condition, I've, patients can see me and tell me that their children have been enrolled into trials and are, and are on uh, treatments and of the, it's only a couple of um, patients, but the, I think child, the, both of those children uh, that have been starting on Tavapton have had difficulties uh, at school with the side effects and they've had to discontinue it. So I don't think it's an easy, um, an easy ride for uh, children to be uh, considered for treatment. But it, 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 as you say, Tess, I know, I know that there are ongoing research trials uh, in this area. 
That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're going to have to bring this session to a close. Um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your time today. And I think really any unanswered questions that have come up in the, in the chat or the Q&A, maybe we, we may be able to sort of pick up um, later. So um, thank you, Graham.